languages and operating systems. Um, and so for me, my focus in the space when I say open source hardware is really on free and open source silicon or FOSSI. Um, and I'm actually also a director of the FOSSI Foundation, which you should also check out. Um, at UCSB, I recently started teaching a first year seminar to a university-wide class uh, of, of uh, what we used to call freshmen um, at the university on open source. And so these are students who have never heard about open source before. They are uh, interested, intrigued by a random course title with a paragraph description uh, in the catalog, and they want to learn about what open source is about. And it's been a really great uh, class to teach uh, that I've enjoyed teaching this past year. Um, this is also an opportunity for me to show off our two very cute cats, Vicky and Voidy, uh, who unfortunately never share their bed. This was the one time, but we saved it for posterity. <laughs> so uh, what was our motivation here uh, in terms of the uh, Trailblazer Fellowship uh, project? So back during my PhD at Princeton, um, I joined the research group I was in, and we were starting to build a chip that was known as Piton, which you can see in the bottom left corner uh, of this slide here. Um, this was back in late 2013, and I was the only computer scientist in a group full of electrical engineers. And to me, taking what we built and making it open source was a very natural thing to do. Um, but for my group mates, they'd never really thought about building anything open source before. And so for all of us as a group, this was kind of our first uh, kind of venture into uh, the open source uh, realm uh, in terms of building something. And what we'd been building was a what we call many core chip, a chip that has a lot of cores. Um, and we're building this uh, for one particular research purpose. And we realized that we'd actually built a platform where people could come along and plug in different research ideas, because that's what we and our group and our collaborators had done when we were building this chip. And so I said, why don't we open source this and make this infrastructure available to other people? We're at Princeton University, this is a university which has an obscene amount of money. Perhaps we should kind of share the resources around and make this available uh, to other people. And since we started the project, so it was open source in 2015, um, we've had about 50, 60 plus uh, published academic works in the form of papers, theses, and so on. Um, they've actually used this platform uh, for different research purposes. And that might be software development on top of the hardware, it might be modifying the hardware in somewhere, or it might be just kind of like some form of analysis, building new tools uh, and using, using the platform. But we actually built this into some real chips. Uh, we have Piton, Cypher, and Decades. The latter two of those we just published uh, this week. Uh, those were actually manufactured in 12 nanometer process, so very uh, cutting edge technology. Um, and we've even seen Intel pick up this platform for their own internal research. And they had a, a paper in last year about a chip that they built. And they were able to go to a conference and like demo their chip booting Linux based off of our design where they had made their modifications, which was really cool. Um, and so having led this project for a number of years, back in 2020, uh, there was a call from IEEE Micro, uh, which is a magazine in our area, uh, for papers on agile and open source hardware design. In the silicon realm, we're seeing a lot of people who are now embarking on journeys in open source silicon. They're building new projects, and they want to share them with other people. They want to encourage use of whatever they're building, because nobody wants to build something and put it in a drawer and never see it again. Um, and so we've been doing this for a few years at this point. We're kind of part of a vanguard of this uh, kind of emerging realm of, of open source silicon. Um, and we wanted to share some advice and lessons learned to our colleagues so that we could help them do more and we could see a bigger growth in the community and bring more people in. Um, and we talked about a lot of things which, you know, not everybody's going to agree on, right? So the design philosophy. We picked a design philosophy. Other people might have other design philosophies, but we want to share this and hear what different people think um, so that we can gain some lessons. Um, we talked about actually managing an open source project. How do you grow your community? How do you maintain it? How do you help people out as they're getting started? Uh, we also talked about how to close the loop on the research. So we were, you know, trying to uh, propose new hardware designs. We, in some cases, we actually go out and build those, and then we come back and we measure them. We understand if they worked, and then we reiterate again. And so. Uh, closing the loop for us is a very important piece. And then this is a project we've been running at this point for you know more than five years, and it had been open source for about five years. And so we're talking a lot about what changed, right? And we didn't want to phrase this paper as one where we say, hey, we did all this stuff wrong, and so you shouldn't do open source hardware. You know, it was like, here's a lot of cool stuff that we did. Also, there were some things that we did wrong, uh, and we should do those better next time. So as the uh, Oshawa Trailblazer solicitation came out, I had recently joined uh, UC Santa Barbara, and I was realizing 
there's a huge amount of open source hardware IP that comes out of the University of California system. And you might have heard of things like RISC-V um, that are out there in the community uh, today, which you know spun out of, of Berkeley and is now a large uh, international uh, trade association. Um, but there's lots of other projects here which you may or may not have heard of for things like early stage uh, simulation of chip designs like Gem5, uh, going through the chip design process. Um, so we have Open Road from San Diego and Open Ram from Santa Cruz. Um, we have uh, platforms for actually building new chips like OpenPTEL that I mentioned, Chipyard, FireSim, DSAGen uh, from some of the other campuses. And this is only a tiny subset, right? And if we looked at open source hardware more broadly than just the silicon component, we would see a whole lot of other stuff that we would be able to include here. And so my pitch was, let's go beyond the case that we normally find. We open up a GitHub repository, we open up a paper, and the documentation is just that. You get some code, maybe there's some useful documentation, but you don't really get to hear about the process that they went through in designing this stuff. And if you're a newcomer, it can be hard for you to, to get in and sink your teeth in. And so I wanted to find the experts from these various UC projects and bring them together to share advice and lessons learned over the course of the time that they've built, been building these projects. And for some projects, like in the case of RISC-V, they've been going on for over a decade at this point, and there's really a wealth of knowledge to share with newcomers so that we can do better in our projects going forward. And so we've been creating a centralized resource where we can share different types of advice materials. So we have uh, talks, which we can share um, from UC faculty. We have interviews with those faculty. We're going to share the videos and the transcripts. Um, and then we also ran a tutorial. Um, and we want to kind of put this all in one place. And so the location that we put together is called Open UC Hardware Advice, or Ouch Advice. This is meant to help you overcome the pain points uh, as you're getting started in open source hardware um, and open source silicon specifically. And so the first piece of this um, was taking experience that we had built from running tutorials um, over the course of uh, building some of our projects. And so it was a little bit hard to pitch this tutorial on how to build a tutorial, a meta tutorial, if you will. Um, but we, you know, we did manage to get an audience. We did manage to advertise enough that we got we got people in the room. Um, and who we're trying to target here is people who are building new platforms, new products for research purposes, where they want to share that with others. And a lot of the time in our community, people say, oh, we should run a tutorial because maybe we'll get some users. And they don't really think very far beyond that. They say, oh, we'll run it once and that will be fine. But we found that by running tutorials many times, we build a lot of experience and we're able to reduce the work for each time. And if we want to build projects which are going to continue in the long term, then this is really important. And so. Uh, we got together uh, myself. I've run about 13 tutorials uh, on the Open Python platform uh, since uh, 2016. Uh, Sagar Karandakar from UC Berkeley, who's been leading a lot of effort in uh, Chipyard and FireSim. And he's run a large number of tutorials as well. We had Elba Garza from the University of Washington, who's a teaching professor there. Uh, Zach Siskel, who's one of our uh, five time teaching associates at UCSB, my PhD student, uh, Nazarka Turtayeva, who is uh, one of my PhD students who has consumes a lot of tutorials and has a lot of opinions on, on the, right, uh, the right material as well. And so we really wanted to help people think about building like the right kinds of content, how to go about the process of designing a tutorial, doing things like actually getting feedback from the audience so that you can make it better over time. Um, and a lot of the advice that we were sharing was from you know, a lot of experience running tutorials again and again and again. And it might seem like, oh, of course you should do these things, right? But if you're sitting down for the first time, you're building a new project, you, you may not have done this before. And it may be new to you. And I'll tell you, we had a lot of things that we did wrong over the first five of those 13 tutorials that, that we ran. Um, there's key things like you're focused on bringing in an audience, helping them understand your platform, and making them into a user. But you're not necessarily thinking about, like, are they going to have a good time? Are they going to have fun in this room when they sit down with us for three, four hours right, to, to learn? Right? You want to bring people into the room. You want them to enjoy it and give them an experience that they'll remember and give them a good user experience so they'll want to keep using your stuff. Um, we have a lot of lessons on how doing live demos are really hard, as many of you will know about. When there's hardware involved in the loop, it's really difficult to do live demos. You can see here my suitcase, which was filled with FPGAs to go to a conference so that we could give a tutorial. We used to take like you know 15 FPGAs to every conference so we could have people in the room use them. All sorts of things that can go wrong. Um, as I mentioned, collecting audience feedback is very important. Um, and then we also had some you know, cautionary tales throughout. You run a tutorial and you find that users do things that you never expected. You find that venues don't work the way that you expected them to. 
you may have noticed there were some Wi-Fi issues here. It's a very common thing when you go and run a tutorial, you get into a room, you find you have no Wi-Fi, and you're like, oh, we needed all of our attendees to SSH into this machine and go and run this code uh, so that they could use our platform. Um, other things like you're going to organize at the last minute. So, you know, plan now for the fact that you will organize at the last minute. Really important advice, it turns out. So from this part of our project, we created uh, some documentation in the form of we ran the tutorial, we recorded it, we have transcripts, uh, we have slides available. Um, we're ready to run this again, and we're excited to run this tutorial again. Um, but you can find those on the OutAdvice website um, alongside uh, some documentation we'll be adding on kind of the specific lessons that we learned from running the tutorials in OpenPTAN. But we also want to get into kind of the deeper aspects of how you get started outside of tutorials. And so we had a special session at the Fossey Latch Up Conference. And what we're trying to do here is encourage newcomers uh, who are just coming in for the first time, learning about open source hardware, who could see a future for their projects, or maybe they never even thought about what the future for their projects could be. Um, and so I was organizing Fossey Foundation Latch Up Conference in Santa Barbara, beautiful location to hold a conference. I recommend you all come next time. Um, and what I wanted to do here was bring in these experts, right? Who's been building these projects over the last n years? All these different types of projects that are coming out of, of the UC, um, and we want the people who've been running them to give experience-based advice. Like, here's what you should think about if you're going to start building a project, something new, um, so that you can get ahead and avoid, you know, pitfalls. Um, we also had a great, uh, great talk on how to use open source hardware tools in order to teach a class on how to build chips. Um, and this was also great because there's a lot of people now who want to make use of open source tools because, hey, they're free. Uh, they're available. We can modify them. Um, and we had about somewhere between 80 and 90 attendees uh, at the event that you can see uh, in the top right corner here. Um, and we also, really excitingly, were able to fund attendance for a number of undergraduates to come to the conference for the first time and have their first conference experience. Um, this was really exciting for us to bring them into the room. Um, and they didn't just uh, participate in the forms of consuming. They actually uh, gave talks as well, which I'll talk about in a moment. And it was really great for them. They had a lot of good stories to tell afterwards about the networking opportunities they had. And in many cases for them, it was like being starstruck. They were showing up like I am today and meeting people who have built things that they're really excited about and that they've been using for years. Uh, four of our talks are here, which we had in person. Um, we've got a couple more that we'll be adding uh, in virtual form as well. Um, and you know, these were really great talks. Like I said, we had Jerry who was talking about uh, kind of how to use open source hardware tools uh, to teach uh, chip design. Um, we had Scott Beamer from Santa Cruz who was talking about if you build it, will they come or who will come? Um, and kind of thinking about your audience. Uh, Professor Renau was talking about a lot of different projects. Uh, he's very prolific in producing open source hardware projects um, and bringing those uh, kind of lessons from those uh, over time. But the other really cool part was that we got to bring the newcomers in and they gave their own talks. So we were soliciting both for full length talks and for lightning talks. And we actually had five talks from undergraduates and MS students who were able to come and give their perspectives on entering the open source hardware community. And this was awesome. We had a bunch of established folks in the room and they were hearing from newcomers talking about where they, you know, what they had built, how they had built it, the decisions that they made. And uh, it was, really a fantastic experience for all these established folks in the room to say, oh, maybe I should think about these things. Um, we were able to summarize uh, a lot of different aspects of the projects they'd built in research and in education, and the videos are available uh, as well. Um, and these are uh, five of the talks that we had. The last piece uh, that we put together here were our UC expert interviews. Um, and so we wanted to get some of our uh, students who were newcomers in this uh, open source silicon realm to actually conduct their own interviews with these experts who have been running a variety of different projects. And we had these newcomers be the ones who pitched their own questions so that they could have the opportunity to ask from people that they see as kind of very big in the community, establishing tools uh, and, and designs that they've been using that they're excited to use uh, in their research and in their work. Um, and so we were able to bring in, uh, we had six in-person interviews and we've got more virtual interviews that will be coming uh, together uh, at the event. And we have transcripts of these posted, which we think will be useful for newcomers who don't have a lot of opportunity to connect with a broader community or haven't had that opportunity just yet and are thinking, 
Could I get involved? How would I get involved? What should my project become? Um, and so we have uh, interview transcripts with a number of folks, uh, and we'll, we'll be bringing uh, more out soon as well. OK, so in closing, uh, here's a piece of meta advice. We should all give more advice. We run our projects, we learn things, and we should share what we've learned as we build those things. A lot of the time when we're putting together our projects, we have a GitHub history, we think, oh, well, somebody could just read the history. They'll figure out what happened before, right? But it completely loses the human element in these projects that we're building of saying, I made a bad decision. I made a good decision. Here's some information about this. Here's something that I can share with others, right? And we all have that opportunity and it doesn't mean that there's one right answer on how to build things. One of the things I was really excited about was to bring a bunch of people into the room and have them give completely contradictory advice uh, to, to the attendees, because we have different experience and we have different goals. Um, and it's important for us to share these things rather than simply dumping code, dumping papers on the internet and saying, hey, good luck. Uh, we hope it'll work for you. Uh, we have the recordings, the transcripts, and the interviews, uh, all available on the Ouch Advice uh, website here. Um, and we're going to be continuing to add content here. And our hope is to keep bringing in more experts and keep getting more advice, more opinions uh, over time. So this was my Trailblazer uh, Fellowship project. And I would like to thank my students, Nazarka, Zach, Parker, several of my other students uh, who put in a lot of effort here, uh, my UC expert colleagues who came, spent the time, met with their students one-on-one, -on -one, gave talks, have been having virtual calls with them, uh, and so on. Uh, to our Oshawa organizers, Alicia, uh, Alicia and uh, Lee, uh, all the mentors that we was able to meet with, the Sloan Foundation for providing the funding, and thank you all for listening to.